Okay. Lesson two and continuing then. Um, so when we analyze literature, um, we just break it apart and try to um, you try to discover more meaning um, than we get on the surface. Uh, I don't know how much of a reader you individually um, are. You know, I, I, I think I've shared with you that I love to read and um, I read novels and um, I read informational um, books as well. My favorite genre um, my favorite type of reading is historical fiction. I love to read stories um, uh, that are based in history, even if, even if there's some fiction aspect. That's my favorite. But no matter what I read, um, I try very hard to kind of break it apart as I'm going and to stop periodically and think back over what I have already read and reflect, reflect means to just, it's like a, your reflection in a mirror, okay? You look and you see yourself. Reflect in literature is the same kind of thing. We, we look back and we, and what do we see? Because sometimes what we see is more than just the words on the page. There's a deeper meaning, right? So um, I try to do that as, as I read longer um, pieces of literature. With short stories, it's a little bit easier to do, but I will tell you that many short stories or short memoirs um, have so much meaning over just a few pages of text. Um, they can be very rich, even though they're not you know, a big, thick book, right? So I would love to know, you know, about your own personal reading and whether you enjoy reading novels or, um, you know, historical fiction, memoirs, you know, what kinds of reading that you enjoy. Most of you are very busy uh, with children and jobs and things like this. So I understand that your reading time may not be as much as you would like for it to be. Um, I certainly, that's been one advantage to having my empty nest when my children left home and, and um, growing a little older along into retirement as I have a lot more time to read and I enjoy that. One of the things that we obviously want to always do is consider the setting of a story and to make sure that we um, have pictured that in our minds and um, thought about all of the um, implications of a setting. The implications of something would be the ways in which um, things matter. And so when we're thinking about setting, the implications can be very important. If a story is set in Siberia, <laughs> the implications of that is that we know um, that this is a harsh environment and that the characters are probably going to be very um, strong people who have learned how to live in this difficult environment. If the setting is totally inside a home, um, we immediately begin to kind of get a feel for what kind of home that is and whether that home is a good place to be or not a good place to be. So setting is really important. It helps us to sort of get a framework about um, about you know where the story is happening and the implications of that. In this case, immediately we're we're told that the, that the setting is an orphanage, and we immediately feel a little bit concerned about that. Um, I, I don't want you to get the impression that all orphanages were bad uh, in um, the United States. I don't know what it might have looked like in, in, in your countries or even if they still exist in your countries of origin. Um, but the general idea of an orphanage uh, is rooted in sadness, isn't it? 
because the children are there, uh, because they were, not, were unable to be kept in their birth homes, whether their parents died, whether their parents simply could not afford to keep them, uh, whether their parents um, were abusive. We know that this child who's living in this orphanage has had somewhat of a difficult start in life to end up here. We, we are not told um, in this story specifically that the orphanage is in Georgia. But we do know that it's in the South. Um, we have a hint about that, the azalea bushes, and springtime. So part of the setting is springtime. The time of year can very much affect um, how we see the story. And I think it's interesting that these two things are very much in contrast because you have this orphanage which is not the most desirable place to be and then you have springtime which is beauty and happiness um, joy and freedom playing outside running freely and these two things are not compatible okay they don't really go hand in hand. Um, we also know that it was the morning, so setting includes time of day, so um, I'm just going to put morning here. Um, we know it occurred outside rather than inside the dormitory, so it was outside at the orphanage um, that that this takes place. Longer stories uh, that cover more than one short incident have many settings, right? The setting changes as it goes along. In this particular story, it's very confined to this setting. There might be some things that you would notice that might you might add to that. The incident. Okay, or we could simply say the memory. The incident or the memory. What is Roger going to tell us about it here? His memory then is of seeing the house parent, and I'll put HP for house parent kill butterflies and pin them to a board. Oops. Okay. That's what he sees. That's the incident. He sees this happen. Now, he describes it in the story, um, gives a lot of um, the description so that as readers we can picture it in our minds. We can, I can almost see this house parent. I have a, an imagination of what he might have looked like. Um, I can see the, the beauty of the springtime and I can see um, this angry action happening at the same time as, as this beautiful setting is um, all around, all around him. The response, and this is um, not our response in this case. This is the response when we're analyzing, okay, we're analyzing, we're analyzing how did the main character uh, in the story, in the memoir, how did they respond? Okay, so this is about Roger. How did Roger respond? Well, we know that he, he was shocked, okay, at what he saw. He was saddened. Let's 
So he responded with emotion. And then he responded with action. He tried to save the butterflies. He did what most children would do. Um, when he tried to save the butterflies, he did it as soon as the house parent was out of the way, was not watching. And he thought, here's my chance. I can save, I can save these butterflies. When he realized that he was caught, he couldn't save them. He became even more sad and even more determined to at least try to put them together so that they could be buried properly. His reflection, he responded and then he reflected or thought about this whole thing and took some final action, didn't he? He reflected on how terrible how terrible for someone to be so cruel. He reflected on what was the what was something that he could do that would be an honorable thing to do. So he reflected on what was the right thing to do. And I hope you can read this. I know it's probably kind of small. And he finally made a decision. And his decision was to bury the butterflies at his fort. Um, and he arrived at that decision through his own reflection, thinking about the situation. How can I make this terrible situation um, bring something good out of it? What can I do? Now this is a simplified process. We know that um, very likely he went through, um, you know, more emotions. He may have cried. Um, he may have gotten angry um, and may have even said some things. He doesn't tell us that he did, but he's a kid and we know he may have, he may have shown some anger. Um, we can't know, but <clears throat> in analyzing the story, we can see that this was a story of contrasts. It was a story of you know, right and wrong, of fear versus freedom, um, a story of, um, of sadness, uh, also um, versus um, freedom, shock. You know, children um, who have who see something for the first time that they've never seen before. Maybe we've protected them from seeing certain things. Parents try to protect their children from from you know witnessing things that are troublesome. Um, so the first time a child sees something uh, that is is troublesome, it can be shocking to them. Same thing with adults, but obviously children, as they grow along, they, they see things for the first time and they, uh, it can be very upsetting. This was a story of, of his shock. It was also a story, I think, though, because of the reflection that he made um, about the whole, the whole thing and the fact that he remembered it. And he is now, I think I told you, he's, he's probably in his mid-70s. He hasn't forgotten this story. This happened to him when he was, you know, like six, seven years old. It's very real today. 
So because he reflected and continued to reflect his entire life, I'm sure, about this and many other stories, then the reflection um, that he did probably was one of hundreds of things that shaped his life, that shaped the way he felt about nature, um, the way he felt about um, freedom, uh, the way he felt about any um, living being being held to something that they didn't choose, whether it be a cardboard, a piece of, you know, paper, or whether it be um, life in an orphanage, or whether it be a prisoner of war, or whether it be, you know, some other way that we um, might in our societies have kept people um, from the freedom that they deserve, um, that, that we as human beings need. So I think that this story just really um, has so much, so much for us to consider and lessons um, to be learned, if not the most important lesson, simply the, the va to value um, our childhoods, um, if they have been good childhoods, and, and to value the gift of, of freedom and the beauty of nature. I hope that this has been a story that you've enjoyed, and um, we'll do some other uh, memoirs, uh, as well as some fiction, um, uh, as we uh, continue to do the nonfiction work that we that we um, do the most of. <laughs> so, but we'll we'll do this every now and then because I think it it uses a different part of our brain, right? And um, that's a good thing always. All right. See you in session three.